Hello, everyone, and welcome to our AgEx trade uh, discussion panel sponsored today by the Canadian Canola Growers Association. I'm Bernie McLean, uh, current chair of the CCGA and a farmer from the northwest part of Saskatchewan. Uh, just a little background on the Canadian Canola Growers Association. CCGA is our national voice of Canada's canola farmers advocating on issues that impact farm profitability. Trade, as we're going to be discussing today, is one of CCGA's key advocacy priorities. Transportation, biofuels, sustainability, business risk management, and crop innovations are a few of the other priorities. Uh, CCGA, as you all may well know, also is an administrator of the Cash Advance, uh, a program sponsored or put forward by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, otherwise known as the Advance Payments Program. So if you'd like to know more about CCGA in today's virtual world that we seem to be operating in, uh, you'll have a chance to uh, hop into the virtual booth and uh, check out the exhibit that CCGA currently has. All right, and with that introduction, I'll, uh, I'll move on and introduce the topic of discussion today, which is ultimately trade, has already been mentioned, but more specifically, Canada's egg trade future. Uh, so on my farm, like many of you, I rely on trade. Uh, most of my products are uh, uh, exported around the world, and I suspect many of you are in a similar situation with over 90% of Canada's farmers being dependent on export markets. So Canada's agricultural sector has grown substantially over the last decade and is well positioned to grow further with an expanding, diverse global population creating new market opportunities. To capitalize, Canada has set ambitious targets of increasing exports by $20 billion by 2025. Continued access into existing markets, growing new markets, and eliminating trade distorting bar barriers is critical to the livelihood of Canadian agriculture and achieving these goals. This year, we've experienced one of the biggest shocks to our global economy that we've ever faced. Yet, we've also seen an amazing resiliency in our ability to continue supplying food around the world. It's amazing. What impact though will that have on agri-food trade going forward? So today we have uh, industry experts joining us, each representing different sectors of uh, the supply chains in agriculture. We'll dive into the future of trade, exploring the opportunities and challenges facing Canadian exporters uh, and exports, including the impacts of the pandemic, and what lies ahead as Canada focuses on our current agricultural exports. So uh, as you may all well know, we have three panelists joining us here today and I'll just take a quick minute to introduce uh, each of them. First, we have Claire Cito. Claire is the Executive Director of the Canadian Agri-Food Trade Alliance, otherwise known as CAFTA. In her work at CAFTA, Claire is on the front lines of helping Canadian agriculture achieve export success. CAFTA is a coalition of national organizations that supports growing Canada's economy through a, more, through a more open and fair international trading environment for agriculture and agri-food. Claire works with a wide swath of Canada's agri-export sectors, including beef, pork, field crops, sugar, malt, and processed foods. Uh, second uh, panelist today is Fawn Jackson. And Fawn is the Director of Government and International Affairs at the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, which represents Canada's 63,000 beef producers. International trade is a fundamental com component of Fawn's work, and she is the lead staff for CCA's Government Outreach and International Trade Committee, which focuses on attaining meaningful market access for Canadian beef around the world. And third, and certainly not least, Jennifer Marchand, Jen is the Government Relations Leader and Assistant Vice President of Cargill. Jennifer represents Cargill on numerous industry and value chain associations, including, including the Western Grains uh, Elevator Association, Cereals Canada, and the Canola Council of Canada. She is a member of the Canadian Grain Commission's Western Standards Committee and uh, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops Steering Committee. All right, and I do look forward to hearing from, uh, from each of your perspectives and the discussion that we're about to have here today. And so just to kind of give the attendees a bit of an idea how the session is going to run, 
so before we get started with the panel here, I'll go over quickly what this is going to look like. First, each speaker will be invited to give a short presentation about their perspectives on trade. Once all three presentations are complete, we'll move into a moder moderated discussion with all of the panelists. Attendees are invited to ask questions throughout the presentation in the chat box, and our panelists will be able to answer you back via text in that chat, chat box as well. So as a quick or a final reminder here, this, this video will be accessible to rewatch after the conference. So Claire, I'll, uh, I'll start in the order that I introduced you guys. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'll give you the floor now to uh, give us your perspective on trade from CAFTA. Thank you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be among so many people who share a passion for trade and advancing the interest of Canada's agri-food sector. In these challenging times, it's more important than ever for like-minded individuals and groups to stand up and work uh, together. As you've mentioned, CAFTA is the voice of Canada's agri-food exporters, representing the 90% of farmers in Canada who depend on trade, as well as the ranchers, producers, processors who want to grow the economy through better access to international markets. Uh, it's about 90% of what Canada exports in terms of ag and food and an economic activity that supports about a million jobs in agriculture and food manufacturing across the country. The way I summarize it, it's all of the agri-food sector, but the supply managed commodities. So as you can tell, a very diverse group, but one that has a united voice when it comes to the need for trade. We export over half of everything we produce, 50% of our beef, 70% of our pork, 90% of our canola. We are inherently uh, dependent on trade. I think we're the sole organization in Canada that, that has trade as its sole uh, mandate. And we work on small acronyms that are really big deals for our members, the CETA, CASMA, CPTPP, CKFTA, and as of last Saturday, the CUKTCA, uh, that's in re reference to the interim deal that uh, Canada announced with the United Kingdom four days ago. Like most people in the world of trade, I tend to be an optimist, but some of my remarks today will be a bit gloomy. However, I think it's important for us to recognize and deal with the challenges that exist and that impede our ability to take advantage of opportunities uh, in front of us. If we were having this conversation a year ago, of course, things would have been a bit different. Uh, COVID happened and changed quite a few things. So uh, what I'd like to say first off is that while the attention at the start of the pandemic really was on regional health responses and local food production and distribution, we all, all have seen um, images on media of empty grocery shelves, meat plant closures and truckers going through the US-Canada borders border at a time of really great restrictions. But I think overall, it's really remarkable. And I say this to a lot of places where I, uh, I speak, I think it's really remarkable that with most of the world on lockdown, global agri-food markets have remained relatively stable. Grocery store, store shelves remain stocked for the most part and food prices have not spiked. It really truly deserves to be recognized just how foundational agri-free trade is for our economy and way of life. And I think this is in large part because governments around the world and Canada uh, leading the pack through the Ottawa Group have recognized that keeping borders open to agri-food is vital to prevent shortages, volatility, supply shocks. And there's been about two dozens of statements by nations of the WTO, G7, G20, OECD and others calling on everyone to keep borders open to agri-food trade. Because really the free flow of inputs, people, products and ingredients is in large part what helps maintain the stability of a network that needs to remain resilient, both for the workers they employ and for the people they need. What was not visible though, is how very quickly more than 93 governments around the world have introduced over 200 trade restrictions and measures that impacted trade and often agri Food. And this for a variety of reasons, legitimate, but also less legitimate. International relations globally have been tested and there's been much work done behind the scenes to keep countries honest and reaffirm commitments to trade based on rules agreed upon. The pandemic really has exacerbated the trade tensions, instability and undermining of trade rules south of the border, but elsewhere as well. The sense is that many in Geneva and others around the world have worked to protect the rules safeguard the, systems, the system and literally hold it together. 
And it's not a coincidence that ministers of trade and foreign affairs around the world have been virtually doubling down on meetings with their counterparts to solidify relationships that reaffirm commitments. On the positive, though, we have seen the crisis accelerate a number of important trade policy measures. We've seen the uh, Canadian government work with the US to keep the border open to agri food trade and allow the flow of inputs, people, services, ingredients. CUSMA, the deal replacing NAFTA, went through the Senate and was ratified in a matter of hours at the WTO, the multi party interim appeal arrangement which is the interim appeal mechanism that works in the absence of a fully functioning WTO dispute settlement body, was announced in April, launched in June, and by August counted 50 members, 30% of the total membership. Trading partners around the world have accelerated the pace of negotiations and implementations of free trade agreements. The Japan-UK deal was concluded in a matter of months. The EU-Vietnam deal was ratified ahead of schedule. And after years of talks, the RCEP deal made progress and was even signed earlier this month. There's been a few free trade agreements in the Asia Pacific that have been uh, modernized as well. Uh, so certainly uh, trade, um, trade liberalization keeps, uh, keeps happening despite COVID. On the other hand though, we have also seen the proliferation of demands to restore supply chains and even calls in our own backyards to become self-sufficient in food. The ink was not even dry on Cusma that the US was imposing new tariffs on steel and aluminum. Uh, and in Europe, in the midst of the lockdown, Italy renewed mandatory country of origin labeling, even though it discriminates against Canadian germ and is deliberately outside of EU law. In recent weeks, we've seen barley, sugar, wine, and wheat from Australia being banned from China because of tensions between the two countries. Every week, the threats and lists of non-tariff barriers grow and agri-food continues to be a weapon of choice. Unfortunately, trade tensions are turning into a newer state of insurgent trade relations where trade rules are blatantly disregarded. As many countries deal with a second wave, WTO members continue to call for open and rules-based trade. There continues to be much work done in Geneva to keep countries honest and unwind measures adopted during the crisis that affected trade. The problem is that today, the unraveling is a big worry. Look at cool in Italy, SPS measures in India, and how easily they can spill to other countries and other commodities just in the name of food security. Today, we're waking up in a new world where we must be prepared and mindful that many countries around the world have and will continue to use to try to use the current crisis to introduce new protectionist measures for political posturing or to push a nationalist and protectionist agenda forward, which will harm recovery and slow global growth. The talk of self-sufficiency from around uh, the, the world and even right here at home is really uh, worrying. So of course, this is a very unusual moment at the WTO, which is the institution that provides the rules and disciplines for how farmers and ranchers food businesses export products and services. The organization is searching for a new DG. This, while the most pillar of the organization is crippled, is crippled, its um, dispute settlement system is no longer fully operational. So really it's no surprise that the buzzword in Geneva these days is transparency and the need for the global trading system to get back on track and do its job of upholding trade rules. Ministers of the Ottawa Group, usually, which, who usually lead WTO reform, went from meeting once a year to meeting every two to three months, really signaling the intensity of the work that's needed in that area. There's been a number of tools and processes that are being put in place to encourage members to uh, speed up and facilitate the timely uh, notification of export rest restrictions. To that effect, CAFTA put forward a number of suggestions and statements to emphasize the importance of timeliness of notifications and transparency moving forward. We've seen a number of countries during the pandemic uh, adopt certain um, uh, behavior uh, and demonstrate their ability to notify in a timely manner. So certainly some of these practices should be made permanent moving forward. There's also been some uh, very encouraging discussions at the SPS um, WTO uh, le level on modernization reforms 
And we had not seen that kind of activity, dare I say, enthusiasm at these tables for some time. So there's some positive and encouraging news as well. Overall, global trade isn't obviously going to cease. The problem is that how free and open and by what rules trade happens really remain unknown. In all this, there needs to be, um, for Canadian agri-food exporters, there's a need to maintain and act enhance access in existing and key markets uh, around the world. For us to take flights, we really need our existing free trade agreements to work. For example, the CETA continues to hold so much promise for Canadian agri-food exporters, yet continues to fall short. Our exports should be much higher. And this is because the EU is not abiding by commitments to remove technical barriers, SPS issues that are affecting the entire value chain for canola, soybeans, wheat, beef, and pork. There is now public recognition of issues, and this is important in starting to address the problems in concrete ways. Things are a bit more encouraging on the CPTPP front, although Vietnam continues to block our access for certain grains, and Malaysia still ha has not ratified the deal. There also continues to be work uh, that needs to be done on the CUSMA front, uh, where we have issues affecting uh, exports of processed food products, as well as sugar-containing products. And there continues to be issues uh, faced by uh, the beef sector in Korea, um, despite the implementation of the CKFTA a few years ago. This is why we've asked Parliament to review, uh, to do a review of opportunities to maximize benefits of free trade agreements implemented in recent years. We need governments to recognize that there are barriers that need to come down if we are to take advantage of, our, some, of some of our most recent trade pacts. Overall, we need better accountability, implementation, and enforcement of free trade agreements. And I like to call this FTA aftercare, which is something that must become more of a priority post-negotiation for government and industry stakeholders. We now need to push on the pedal and not the brakes to diversify. Can we strengthen, grow, modernize our existing free trade agreements and ensure partners don't roll back on commitments? We need to implement an interim deal with the UK before the end of December and almost immediately start negotiating a better deal with them. We need to launch talks with ASEAN, the ASEAN region, after three years of exploratory discussions. We need to grow the CPTPP. That's what it was built for. We need to finalize the Pacific Alliance deal as well. We always must be looking for an edge in a fiercely competitive global economy because our competitors are act actively uh, doing so. And the final point I'd like to share with you um, today, uh, because in the end, as I mentioned earlier, I'm also an, op an optimist. There are many opportunities um, uh, moving forward. The global demand for agri-food products will continue to grow rapidly. And this presents an immense opportunity for Canada. We are today the fifth larger exporter of agri-food products in the world, but we used to be the second, and perhaps we have an opportunity to get back to that rank. The export-oriented agri-food sector certainly can help anchor Canada's economy uh, moving forward. Before the crisis, our sector was the growing. Uh, the Before the crisis, our sector was growing faster than all other sectors in the economy. But to successfully take advantage of opportunities that lie ahead, government and industry need to work hand in hand if we are to capitalize on these opportunities. There's no question that our members take pride in feeding families and in Canada and around the world. But the reality is that we have become the fifth larger agri-food exporter in the world, precisely because we have specialized in making products that the world wants and needs. Free trade has always been a key part of Canada's growth and it will remain even more important moving ahead. But we should prepare for protectionism, for, for, but we should prepare for protectionism to make things a lot more difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That was uh, an in-depth conversation, or an in-depth perspective, certainly. And uh, and I actually look forward to our discussion here uh, in the question and answer session. I know uh, we can maybe dive into a few of these topics uh, uh, at a little deeper depth. So so with that, again, thank you. And Fawn, please, uh, your perspective from the livestock sector. Yeah, well, great. Well, thank you so much for having us. And uh, it's always wonderful to talk about trade is something that's so important to uh, Canadian farmers and ranchers 
uh, and really important to Canadians. Uh, in the beef sector specifically, we export 50% of uh, what we produce. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity on the horizon, but there is also uh, a number of challenges as Claire has, has just outlined. So I'm gonna, you know, sort of do a bit of a recap of what the year has looked like for us, and then um, talk about some of the directions that I think that we need to go. Uh, so first of all, um, you know, I, I think that the opportunity for trade uh, in COVID recovery uh, should really be looked at very closely by all governments. Uh, over the last number of years, Canadian exports have grown three times faster than the Canadian average, uh, which really, um, you know, drives home the fact that agriculture, agri-food is a net contributor to Canada's economy. Uh, this is certainly being noticed by, um, by governments, and I think everybody is really driving uh, efforts to, to try and capture on the opportunity that is out there uh, in the world. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, there have been a number of free trade agreements that have come into place that have really driven this opportunity that exists for us today. So when we look, you know, there was the Canada-Korea free trade agreement in 2015. There was CETA, which is with Europe in 2017. CPTPP, which was, you know, a really big deal for our industry, um, came into force in 2019. And then the new NAFTA, of course, and uh, the Canada-UK transitional agreement um, here this year. So, you know, when we look at the last 10 years, it was really about getting those fundamental pieces down. And uh, I think that the next 10 years are really going to be about how to manage technical uh, access as that's certainly getting more complicated. In the beef industry, COVID brought us quite a few challenges. Uh, I think everybody has heard about it in the news if, uh, you know, you're listening and perhaps you were, uh, um, you know, experiencing it. So in the spring, we lost a significant uh, portion of our processing capacity. Um, we dipped below 50% of our processing capacity and this had very serious implications um, for our producers in Canada, um, but also for our ability to, to export. So I think that we can't talk about trade without sort of understanding uh, what happened uh, with, with COVID. So, you know, our, the value of cattle dropped over six, five to six hundred dollars. Um, and, and what we saw was a need to uh, quickly recover, um, to uh, build resiliency into our systems. And, you know, I think overall, we, we saw that happen. And it's something that I think as Canadians, uh, we should be really, really proud of, but also not take for granted that, of course, second waves can cause um, future challenges. And so that we need to be just as prepared and just as resilient in any future um, waves of, of, of COVID or other challenges <laughs> that of course um, might uh, come forward. So while there were very significant challenges uh, that COVID uh, brought forward for the beef industry specifically, um, you know, I think we've seen uh, you know, quite a good, a good recovery. Overall within the Canadian economy, agriculture did very, was very resilient um, throughout. You know, I think that makes a lot of sense to folks because of course we're an essential service. So, you know, we really don't have an option. <laughs> um, but when you look at, for example, hours worked um, throughout COVID, uh, agri-food saw uh, only, you know, a 3% decline in number of hours worked within the sector, whereas other sectors saw um, much larger, you know, double um, the, the um, the hours worked. So EDC saw agriculture as one of the most resilient um, sectors for COVID-19. And then also one of the sectors that of course is able to really lead us out of, of COVID-19 in terms of, um, of economic recovery. So how then do we capture on this, you know, opportunity that is out there um, while tackling some of the challenges that certainly uh, exist today. Um, so I'm going to talk about a number, three, three key areas. One I think is business risk management for our producers. Two is how to focus on technical trade. And then three is about um, continuing to advance um, free trade agreements. 
So on the business risk management side, I think that producers have seen and governments have seen uh, that producers are very aligned across Canada asking for a more robust business risk management program. And um, you know, this is very, very important to our producers and our ability to reinvest in agriculture um, to be able to um, with, withstand the, the challenges that are coming. You know, and they're not only challenges um, that are so extreme like COVID, but it might be uh, a market disruption, it might be a flood, it might be, you know, all of these other um, things that could disrupt uh, production. And without that assurance that, um, you know, you're not going to lose your shirt over um, what might be something that is extremely out of your control, um, it's, it's difficult to uh, invest at the same level that we might be if we had those um, business risk management programs in place. So you've seen Canadian agriculture very aligned in saying that we need stronger business risk management programs. And I think that that, you know, is all interconnected uh, with, with trade. Uh, secondly, in terms of technical trade access, you know, I mentioned previously that the last 10 years was about free trade agreements. And the next 10 years, I think, is really going to be about technical trade access. So for us in the beef industry, uh, Asia is a very large market uh, with a, a lot of potential in the future. But for us, we have a number of restrictions uh, in, in many of those markets that are held over from the BSE era. So things like we aren't able to ship over 30 month uh, cattle into a number of markets. We might not be able to ship offals uh, into a number of markets. And this not only has uh, impact on our ability to ship into those markets, but actually can have an impact on our North American market as well. So an example of that would be that we are not able to ship um, over 30 month cattle into South Korea, which then actually takes US packers um, out of in being interested in buying uh, Canadian cattle in Eastern Canada because they're needing to segregate them at their packing plants. So that technical access and making progress on, on it is not only important for our ability to grow, but also for our ability to have appropriate market signals within the North American highly integrated um, market. Uh, we've also seen, of course, that the Canada-China relationship has been very complicated um, over the last number of years. Um, and well, no, since 2019, it has really gotten um, a lot more complicated. And, you know, some of that is technical access, but it's, it's also, um, of course, the Canada-China uh, relationship uh, largely. And so we need to uh, work with other um, international partners in advancing what is really good for, um, for all of us, which is free and open uh, and predictable uh, trade. Also um, on the technical um, side of things, I would also say that COVID uh, emboldened a number of um, countries to put in place um, significant programs to support their farmers uh, going through um, the challenges that COVID-19 uh, brought forward. For some, that has meant that a significant portion of their farm income is now coming from um, these types of, of programs and policies that were put in place. We need to, as an international community, be adamant that, um, that those programs are rolled back in a timely manner and that there aren't things that carry on um, into the future which would really um, skew trade in, in, in a not positive um, way, particularly um, you know, I think it's important that we also look within in Canada and how to make sure that we um, are leaders in in that area. Uh, we also need to advance free trade agreements and perhaps at times also revisit trade agreements that we already have in place. So for us in the beef industry, uh, we talk a lot about Canada and South Korea being excellent, predictable uh, trading partners. But right now, we are significantly behind the US and Australia uh, in terms of our access within to that market on the tariff front. And so we think that it's a great time that um, Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement has been in place for five years. Well, let's revisit it and see how we can make um, trade uh, even 
advanced between uh, South Korea and, and Canada. There's also, of course, um, you know, on the, on the horizon, a new free trade agreement uh, with the UK. And of course, there is a transitional agreement in place um, that was just recently announced, um, but we need to be more ambitious than um, replicating CETA. I think that um, uh, the UK has um, indicated that they're very interested in, re, uh, in entering CPTPP and, uh, you know, CPTPP is very very ambitious in um, in what it set out and what it achieved in terms of uh, setting a stage for for free trade. And so we need an FTA um, with the UK that would enable them to quickly transition uh, into uh, CPTPP. Uh, also on expanding uh, free trade agreements, we have this great CPTPP that we need to be inviting people in or people economies into uh, to continue to grow. And that's not only important um, for, uh, you know, growth, but also important for uh, competitiveness. And uh, there was just an, a new trade agreement that was announced in the Asian uh, region that uh, Canada was not part of. And uh, we need to remain competitive in that region. And so uh, I would certainly see CPTPP expansion with economies such as Thailand or Taiwan or South Korea as um, being something that we would of course have to look at, examine um, what, the, what the, the, the terms of trade would be. But I think that there's a really significant opportunity there and that we should be championing um, the value of trade on the world stage and bringing other uh, economies in. You know, I think that that um, that as as I've said that that trade is is really Canada's future. It's been our history and is going to be our future. And I think that uh, agriculture has um, a responsibility to um, uh, advance agriculture and food uh, in, in the conversation in. Uh, provincial and federal governments so that we can really uh, capitalize on this and help Canada recover uh, from COVID-19. So I'm looking forward to the questions, Bernie, and uh, yeah, just uh, I suppose I'll end there. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Fawn. Uh, uh, very in-depth as well. And, uh, you know, I'm already starting to recognize some common points and themes here. So uh, this is going to be a good discussion, I can tell. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind giving us your perspective from the grain sector, uh, that would be great. Absolutely. Thanks, Bernie. And thank you so much for having me here today to speak to Canada's trade future of grain and oil seeds. Before I discuss the future, I feel it's very important to highlight the success story that the grain and oil seed supply chain has been as we have navigated the new frontier of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, despite lockdowns and all of the challenges that we encountered, the grain and oil seed supply chain operated with really minimal to no impact. By the end of the crop year, the, the, there was a backlog of over 5 million metric tons um, seen in February, and this was alleviated plus an additional volume that led to the 2019-2020 crop year, setting a record movement of 53.7 million metric tons. COVID-19 did not impact the movement of grain to its export position and in fact, went to an increase in available rail capacity that allowed us to recover from what could have been insurmountable setbacks that occurred earlier in the year. So while there was significant uncertainty and disruption in some sectors, the grain and oil seed supply really kept the pace and, and provide, continued to provide critical food to Canadians and the world. And I think that's something that, that everyone in the supply chain should be very proud of. So then the question becomes, what does the future look like? And what does the post COVID environment look like? Um, what have we learned? One thing that you know is top of mind and ever present is we are feeding the world and the need has never been greater. So to continue to meet the needs of Canadians and global demand and stay competitive in an increasingly complex global marketplace, all stakeholders in the value chain are going to need to continue to look at efficiency opportunities, modernization and innovation to ensure that our supply chains move as rapidly as possible. 
Today, I'd like to run through a few points highlighting barriers that we will need to overcome, areas where we're going to continue to need to grow, and where we need to work to not only stay competitive, but harness opportunity. So first, I'll talk a bit about the global trade environment's um, current and future state, uh, which Claire and Fawn captured very well. So globally, we're dealing with increasingly protectionist practices and non-tariff trade barriers are becoming more and more common. Trade is increasingly used as a weapon and we see um, an increased trend towards nationalism. We've seen many examples of this, cool in Italy and, and our canola challenges in the grain and oil seed sector. So, so for the grain and oil seed sector to thrive in the future, the government of Canada must continue to advocate for rules-based trading systems and address technical barriers to trade and work with our trading partners and international bodies to establish science-based regulatory frameworks that are impacting trade. We really need to continue to work on and foster the relationships we've established with our key trading partners and address the apprehensions that they have regarding the risks. Another topic really important to discuss when speaking about the global trade environment is the regulatory environment as it has impact on our industry. So I think it really needs to be highlighted that the regulatory environment, both globally and domestically in Canada, is something else that we, we need to look to um, and examine um, when we're thinking about our future success. Regulatory systems differ around the world and, and this creates challenges. When a product is acceptable in one market, but not in another, it provides significant barriers to innovation and commercialization and really slows down our, our progress at, as an industry. Additionally, when other countries' regulatory environments are more efficient than, than ours are in Canada, we lose out on opportunity. So then the question is, how do we get past this? In Canada, we really need to ensure that our regulatory systems are modern, efficient, and, and globally aligned. There needs to be a focus on eliminating unnecessary barriers along the value chain, clear pathways to innovation, and efficient processes to support commercialization. There needs to be commitment to not only the protection of the grain and oilseed supply chain, which of course is, is critical, but to the success and growth of the industry to allow us to remain competitive and not put us at a disadvantage to other countries. Um, essentially, we, we can't place barriers on ourselves that decreases our competitiveness. Another kingpin of our future success in, in, in trade, I think, is, is our infrastructure. So our infrastructure must be a priority going forward. If we can't get our grain and oil seed products to export locations and meet our global customer demands as, as quickly as possible, they will look to other markets. So a key priority going forward will need to be investment in rail and port infrastructure, and additionally ensuring continuous flow of product without disruption as it moves to its destination. Efficiency is really going to be the name of the game. You know, we're going to need bigger and longer trains. Uh, every segment of the supply chain is going to need to squeak out every bit of efficiency um, that it can. It's, it's a necessity for, for Canada to compete. So, you know, we're going to need to be able to maintain a really cost competitive supply chain infrastructure to stay competitive and harness opportunity globally. So as we look at the future and knowing what we need to do, how can we compete and succeed going forward? And how can we be the choice of our global customers in, in the trade environment that exists today? What we need to do is, is turn our thoughts to innovation and diversification. We need to think of what customers' future needs will be and look to create what meets those needs. We need to ask ourselves questions. What are innovative uses for grain and oil seeds? Where are there gaps in the marketplace and how can we fill them? How do we innovate to meet consumer trends and demands? I think historically, we have been in the grain and oil seed sector primarily focused on finding new geographical markets for what we produce. But going forward, we're going to need to place more focus on innovation and in the value added space. As an industry, we need to foster relationships with our global partners and understand what their needs are and 
what, what they anticipate that their needs will be in the future. So really forward thinking. The grain and oil seeds industry continues to innovate and evolve and match up supply with what the world is demanding. And some excellent examples of that are high oleic canola oil, uh, non-GM soy flakes and mid protein wheats. These things didn't just happen. This was a result of people innovating based on customer need and scanning the environment and thinking creatively. Post COVID, we need to continue to focus on investment and innovation. I think it's also going to be critical as we move forward to open our minds to the value added area. An example of this is alternative proteins. It's, it's a, an example of a market that is available and it's growing and it provides another outlet for us to nourish the world and, and be profitable. Another great example of a new um, market is aquaculture feed and aquaculture as an opportunity for canola grown on the prairies. It's an excellent example of how we can even further increase the value and use of our Canadian crop. Another area with real promise is alternative fuels. So with greater expectations on greenhouse gas reductions, Canadian grain and oil seeds can be part of the solution. Uh, what's necessary for that to be successful are clear pathways and regulatory frameworks to support investment to allow us to capitalize on that opportunity. You know, um, Canadian grain and oil seeds have so much value to deliver and we need to continue to think forward and outside the box to stay competitive in a rapidly changing uh, global trade environment. Digitalization is another area that I'm certain you've heard about and you're going to hear more and more about. So digitalization of trade will have a huge impact on trade going forward. Being able to execute as rapidly as possible on transactions uh, will be part of the necessary efficiency I spoke about earlier to increase and um, stay competitive. The speed at which farmers and buyers interact will continue to be revolutionized. A good example of this is GrainBridge and Cargillag.ca. Data of all sorts is really going to help us make better and faster decisions. It will help us determine where we should play more and where to play less. Data is going to give us increased intelligence on markets and help us make decisions. Another area that is becoming more and more important is the traceability of supply chains. For this to happen, data needs to be collected, available, linked. As we see more interest from the consumer on traceability globally, we must find ways to ensure that the data needed is available. And then finally, when looking to the future success of global grain and oil seeds trade, I think it's important to touch on sustainability. So being able to tell the exceptional sustainability story of the Canadian grain and oil seed sector is going to become increasingly important. Right now, sustainability certification is a requirement as an example for canola to the European Union for use in the biofuel space. And, and this has become an increasingly important market for, for Canada. In the European Union, they're short of their own crop and importing more from Canada than they have historically. So more of what we need to produce uh, must be sustainable. In, in the next two years, we see this demand maintained at the current level and, and that's massive growth, growth from the past. Further to this, uh, we will be seeing more destinations requiring sustainability assurances because they sell oil into the European Union or their country is starting on a sustainability journey. So if we are proactive in this space, we're going to be prepared and have immediate access when it becomes a requirement in other markets. If we can get ahead of it, um, we can capture that opportunity. Uh, getting a strong foundation to our sustainability story right now is going to really well position us globally um, as, as trade in this space increases and opportunity emerges. So to wrap up, I, I think the future is, is really bright. So I'm, let's, I'm on the optimism team as well. So the future is bright for Canadian grain and oil seeds. The supply chain has demonstrated its resilience. 
but capturing the opportunity ahead of us is not going to come passively. Our ports and railways will need to be able to handle the demand ahead or we're going to lose out on opportunity. We need a regulatory environment where there are clear paths and processes that support innovation. We will need increased focus on innovation to meet customer needs. And we will need to have investment and attention paid to capturing our sustainability story. We need to explore um, diversifying markets, not only in terms of geography, as I mentioned, but, but in our product offering. So with that, thanks, Bernie, and I will pass it off to you. All right, thanks, Jen. And uh, as expected, I, I thought your perspective or presentation might uh, really hit home and it, and it certainly does for me as a grain and oil seeds producer here. So again, thank you for the, thank you for your perspective. And uh, I guess I'll just, I'll sum up this, uh, this little bit with uh, the one thing that stands out to me very clearly on a very positive note is the agriculture sector, and I'll include myself in this, is uh, very, op very optimistic. We're, we're eternal optimists. And, you know, I heard it from all, all of you. That's, that's one thing that drives agriculture forward. And that's a great thing. Uh, COVID-19, you know, that's, that's been a big factor when it comes to trade. That's huge. Uh, but what I also heard very clear here today is trade is extremely important when it comes to the agriculture sector. And, and the one thing that COVID-19 has proven to us is our resiliency as a system. So kudos to all of us that, uh, that are working to make that, uh, uh, make that happen. Obviously there's difficulties, Jen, I think you alluded to some of it, the uh, non-tariff trade barriers. Uh, I think you all touched on protectionism and certainly those are, those are issues moving forward, but there are huge opportunities as well. So the, again, the internal optimist uh, will, will look at the opportunities and work on the difficulties. So, so no, that's great. And uh, so with that, I would like to move into some of the questions and answers here. I don't want to go too much into uh, summarizing too much here because I think I'm going to summarize some of these questions and I don't want to do that before you have a chance to respond. Uh, so with that, I think I'll start it off then and I'll, uh, I'll address this first question to all three of you if you don't mind and I'll start with Claire. Again, I'm going to try and keep it in order uh, as we presented there. I'll start with Claire and move to Fawn and then to Jennifer on this one. Uh, so question number one, what do you see as the most promising trade and market development opportunities uh, for Canadian agri-food going forward and how can Canada be better positioned for export success into the future? So Claire, if you wouldn't mind to touch on that one. Sorry about this. Uh, I think I touched on it earlier um, and really I believe that with the demand for uh, food around the world and our vast amount of resources in, in Canada, we have tremendous growth opportunities to supply the world with um, safe and quality uh, agriculture and food, uh, food products. As I mentioned, we used to be the second largest agri-food exporter in the world, and we certainly have an opportunity to um, um, do that uh, again. Uh, but this will require a certain amount of um, fight against the protectionist climate climate that we are experiencing uh, today. And we need to be nimble uh, in the way we, we do things. Perhaps we need to enhance our diplomatic uh, capacity to be better focused on, on the policy um, uh, that's required and having foots on the ground to identify issues before they become issues for our, our grain and cattle and beef producers uh, here, here at home. So certainly lots of opportunities, but now we need to look at how we can do better and do things differently and uh, prevent fires um, uh, instead of fighting fires, essentially. Very good, thank you. Uh, Fawn? Yeah, I think there's uh, two key opportunities. Uh, number one, I would certainly say Asia, uh, just the potential of growth there for um, beef and other agriculture products. And I think that we should be um, very strategic in the resources that we have to foster those diplomatic conversations that need to happen uh, within, within that region. Um, so that, that would be one, but then the second one I would say is diversification is I think certainly going to be our strength. 
uh, for um, you know the beef industry, we say that um, for each animal, given the markets that we have access to, it adds six hundred dollars um, versus if we were only able to sell into the Canadian market. Um, so markets such as Europe, for example, where uh, the product that we ship there is very high quality and it's uh, you know pulling a price of around the you know, 12 to $17 per kilo, where our next highest market is Hong Kong, that's around the $9 per kilo. So I think that we need to think uh, both strategically about, um, you know, Asian markets, but then also where uh, we can get specific cuts or specific products for agriculture into uh, diverse markets, because when you add it all up, that's really um, drives the overall value. Perfect, thank you, and Jennifer? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Fawn. I think what comes to my mind is, is diversification and innovation. So looking to what global customers need and are going to need and working to innovate to meet those needs. Um, and another thing I think about is health and con con consumer trends. And um, these play a significant role in what customers are demanding. Um, you know, if you look at um, diversification and our existing products, uh, finding new uses for them. So alternative proteins, as I had mentioned, um, is a growing space and a market that's open for business or biofuels, as an example, and, and uses out, outside of this food space. So um, thinking about um, opportunity with uh, maybe a non-traditional lens. Perfect, thank you. And uh, for the next question here, I'm actually just going to look to Fawn and Jennifer, I think. Uh, I think we're okay for time. So Claire, if you wanted to jump in with a quick comment, by all means, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of focus on, on Fawn and Jennifer here for this one. So I guess the, the, the second question here then will be, what can farmers do to mitigate the impacts that uh, trade related, related market fluctuations uh, have on our farms? And I mean, we've alluded to it, I think, in, in actually all three presentations, I've heard some of this and uh, maybe there's an opportunity to go into a bit more detail here. So Fawn, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I certainly, earlier when I was speaking, I talked about business risk management programs, and I think it's really important to have um, um, consultations with, uh, you know, your experts, your accountants, your um, team that helps you uh, make those uh, decisions on whether to use those programs or whether or not to use those programs um, and, and take them very seriously because, I think that trade is has lots of opportunity, but there's also risk associated with it. And I think that for the next number of years, um, most people who work in trade um, um, do see volatility there. And so I think that those are going to be even um, bigger considerations for us going forward. Uh, I would also say that, you know, looking at how you can diversify within your operation, the opportunities uh, that might be there. Um, so for um, the beef sector, um, you know, some opportunities that come to mind is can you get certified to be able to ship to Europe and have that hormone free um, certification? Could you have the certified sustainable beef, um, which is more of a domestic uh, program, but I think certainly uh, sustainability, as Jen had talked about, is going to be very important in international trade in the future. So I think that looking at how you can um, um, perhaps build some resiliency uh, is just going to be really important for, for everybody. Certainly. Thank you. And Jen? Yeah, 100% of fun. So, you know, diversity is strength. And one area that can increase resiliency is, is differentiating the on-farm on product mix. You know, diversity is a real shield in changing times. Another, another way to, to do so is to actively use grain marketing services and, and take advantage of cash price carries when they're available. I think also if, you, if you're looking at, you know, how do you manage these swings, balancing what goes to export with selling to more domestic demand markets as well. So thinking about crushed plants, mills, et cetera, diversification really helps to mitigate the impact as market fluctuations present themselves. No, that's great. And I, uh, I'm happy to hear both of your responses, actually, because on my own farm, I am diversifying, not into beef. I'm actually looking at bison. Uh, we actually have some now in partnership with another neighbor. So, so I'm working on it. Uh, I hear you on the BRM 
issues there and the programs that we have in our uncertain environment that we're operating in and that continues whether it's trade or weather or whatever that might be uh, as well as uh, Jennifer's comments on uh, differentiating products you know there is there's specialty oil and markets out there there's there's high quality markets uh, feed barley versus malt barley those types of things so so anyways I uh, I don't want to take up the time on, on answering the questions but I agree wholeheartedly with both of you thank you uh, so my third point here, China is a very large market for Canada's agri-food products, uh, but recently there have been numerous issues affecting our exports to that country and uh, Fawn and uh, Jen and Claire, you all three touched on, on some of these issues, whether it was Korea or China, uh, but where do you see Canada's trade relationship with China going in the future? And uh, Claire, if you wouldn't mind, I'll, uh, I'll ask for your uh, opinion on this or thoughts on this one. Sure. Um... So as you know, um, trade is a big part of the China uh, relationship and China is a huge market for agri-food. It's our second export market um, and it continues to be a, a very important market for the vast majority of our Canadian agri-food products. What we need to do with China is have more rules-based trade and have trade really governed by rules that's predictable and not um, disrupted. Uh, of course, uh, it's obvious that there are uh, tensions but uh, between Canada and China, but just as you can't turn on or off the demand for food in China, you can't turn on or off the trade relationship with China as well. Um, and um, I think that China also needs from Canada a long-term trade uh, relationship. So the very same way Canada needs to uh, uh, build a stronger ties with uh, its key trading partners uh, around the world. Uh, it needs to do so with, uh, with China. China is projected to be the world's largest um, uh, food importing nation uh, by 2025. And certainly uh, rules-based trade is what helps us grow in the agri-food uh, sector. So um, we need uh, to make sure that we have um, long-term and, and positive win-win um, uh, relationship with uh, China that really are focused on the commercial uh, viability of, uh, of trade. So really it's our expectation that um, both countries would act in a way that enables uh, growth and prosperity for our sectors and that means uh, trading with, uh, with China. It certainly represents a large-scale solution to the the federal, the federal government's goal of um, reaching uh, 75 billion in exports by 2025. Very good, thank you. Uh, Fawn, can you uh, provide a, a few comments here as well? Mm, uh, you know, I think it's undeniable that um, Canada and China have a complicated relationship at the moment, um, but that we need to look uh, long-term. 10 years ago, we basically traded no beef uh, with China. And last year, before we hit those um, challenges in the fall of 2019, uh, they were on track to be our second largest market. Um, so, you know, I think that Canada is a very good trading partner. Uh, we are rules-based. We have highly safe uh, food. We um, do not use food as a uh, political uh, way to intervene. Um, so I think that for a number of reasons, uh, Canada is uh, a very valuable partner uh, with China on the food front. And I think that what we need to do is to be steady in our conversations. Um, we need to be strategic in alignment internationally with our partners who uh, also have um, challenges when trade difficulties come forward. Um, and I, I think that we also um, need to look at others who have very good working relationships uh, and think about how we can uh, build off of that. So New Zealand certainly uh, comes to mind. Um, but you know, I, I think that, that we are going to turn a corner on this. And um, I think that we just need to be steady and, uh, and diversify in the meantime. I think that that will have benefit not only if there are interruptions uh, into uh, that market, but will also 
um, you know, be a leverage in, in our general conversations uh, with them. So uh, it's challenging, but I think that we need to focus on the long term. Absolutely. Thank you. And again, if, if, if anybody else, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm trying to uh, jump around as to who I would like to answer each question, but if, if anybody else does want to, uh, by all means, give me a hands up or something that I can, uh, I can see that you want to indicate and, or, or want to contribute to the, to the answer. And I'll, uh, I'll definitely call you in here too. Uh, so with that though, I, uh, Kind of one, I think, a little more specific for Claire here. And Claire, you alluded to a lot of this in uh, in your uh, your presentation here earlier on today already. Uh, but speaking to NAFTA 2.0 or CUSMA or USMCA, I think is what the official term is supposed to be, uh, CEDA, CPTPP. And you actually named off a few others there, and I know they're out there, but uh, uh, they're not fresh in my mind. So obviously... Free trade agreements are, are significant and, and we need those free trade agreements to work. Uh, what opportunity is there um, for free trade agreements to, to work better for Canadian agriculture? And I know you, you've actually alluded to it already and, and so did Fawn and Jennifer, but, uh, but can you go into a little more detail when it comes to, to how that uh, free trade agreements can work better for, for Canadian ag? I think there's a few things that we need to do first. Uh, we need to um, recognize that um, trade is about tariffs, but also non-tariff barriers. Um, there's been a lot of talks in recent years about um, um, tariffs being applied for a number of uh, measures. So people often associate um, trade with tariffs. But the big part of the equation, uh, the invisible part of the iceberg, is really non-tariff barriers. Uh, in our experience, we see free trade agreements being implemented, tariffs coming down, but non-tariff uh, barriers coming, uh, coming up. And those have become more problematic um, than tariffs themselves. So um, it's really important now that Canada has those big free trade agreements implemented in, in recent years that they really, truly uh, work, um, whether it's the, we continue to have a number of issues, for example, with the SETA, whether it's related to the timely approval of biotech uh, traits, um, processes uh, that allow um, our uh, crop protection products to be approved in Europe. Uh, we need to have recognition of meat processing systems. We need to have illegal country of origin labeling uh, removed. Uh, so uh, all of these non-tariff barriers, uh, there needs to be, I think, first a recognition that they exist. Uh, we are seeing now our officials talk about them more uh, publicly. And this is important because what, uh, what really gets recognition gets action. The more we are going to be able to talk about this and raise the awareness, the better, uh, I think, uh, equipped our um, industry and officials are going to be in, in tackling those. Fantastic. And that I uh, couldn't agree more. I mean, non-tariff trade barriers, it's, uh, it's alive and well, that's for sure. Um, great points on, on the recognition first. I, I couldn't agree more. That's, uh, if that's happening, then, uh, then action can be taken. So thank you for that. And uh, actually for the next point here, I'm going to kind of refer more so to the, to the two uh, uh, exporters, I guess, on the panel today. Uh, Jen being with Cargill and uh, and Fawn with the Cattlemen's Association. So again, this COVID-19, the global pandemic, it's taught us about Canadian agri-food exporting. Uh, what what have we learned uh, from this? And again, I know you guys have touched on it a little bit already, uh, but what has this global pandemic taught us about the Canadian agri-food exporting and our global supply chains? Uh, Jennifer, if you wanted to start. Yeah, sure. So. You know, COVID-19 has showed us just how generally resilient the agri-food supply chains are, but what it also did was exposed gaps where there was opportunity to improve and, and where there were opportunities for um, efficiencies. So as we navigated COVID-19 and, and things were changing, everyone in the value chain was learning as we navigated the crisis and adjusting and adapting. And there was evolution in all sectors, supply chains. And 
what what really struck me was how quickly we learned that it's necessary to collaborate across value chains to navigate a crisis and 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 it was key to our successes in, in keeping that value chain going so when we look to future resiliency that ability to work across value chains on solutions is going to be absolutely critical when when all sectors were working together to keep the supply chain moving it was easier and and, and it had impact and and i think there was a great deal of creative thinking and innovation that happened due to the pressure being faced you know it was this necessity we have to solve this issue um, both by government and by industry but that type of thinking needs to be continuously applied um, to ensure our future competitiveness competitiveness so we need to carry that mindset forward and that's going to increase the necessary efficiency that i mentioned earlier and allow Canadian grains and oil seeds and certainly all Canadian agri-food products to stay competitive and, and be the choice of, of our global customers. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Fawn, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it certainly uh, showed a lot of resiliency, as Jen said, I think, um, and, and that that resiliency is dependent on an integrated international market. So within Canada, you know, as we were having our challenges in the beef industry, we were being, bringing in product uh, from the US, from New Zealand increased, from Europe increased. Uh, and what we like to say is we were happy that Canadians were able to continue eating beef, but of course we're gonna compete uh, when we were able to. Um, so, you know, I think that it showed just how important that is. And while some people called into question, um, you know, food resiliency um, at a more local level, I think that what we really need to be recognizing is just how important it was at that international level and to have um, um, trustworthy trade partners was, um, you know, extremely important uh, in, in being able to make sure that food uh, stayed on, on shelves. I think um, what it also taught us is that we need to be more prepared and have more tools on the shelf that we can pull off um, when needed. So an example of that would be in the beef industry, um, we uh, have a set-aside program um, that is really excellent for helping um, manage uh, large fluxes uh, in the amount of cattle that we have ready for uh, processing and help uh, restabilize uh, the market. And so that was a program that we used during the BSC years um, and that admittedly it took some time to pull off the shelf. And so I think that, you know, thinking about these sorts of crisis um, situations uh, that, you know, we need to be thinking about it now, but also certainly when we're uh, you know, able to reflect on COVID-19 about, okay, what tools do we want on the shelf and in what situations would we um, pull them off? Um, so I think that, you know, those are a couple of, of the lessons is how, how to be quicker. You know, I think we were very, uh, we were, we were quick, um, but how can we be quicker? I think it is something that we should always um, be thinking about. How can we be better at this? Certainly fantastic. And, uh, you know, if you don't mind, I, I've I heard it a couple of times, so I'm just going to back up and kind of pull one out of the air here a little bit for you guys. And uh, in the sense that we've uh, both you mentioned resiliency, and that's great. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, our sector has done very well with that. Uh, and it, it's maybe just something to, to ease my mind here a little bit. Jen, you had mentioned value chain collaboration. So, so when I'm thinking of value chain creation or uh, collaboration when it comes to the grains and oil seed sector, obviously, I think that all lines up and it and it makes sense in a in an easy manner. Uh, what I'm curious about, though, when it comes to value chain collaboration, can we include beef and livestock and horticulture? I mean, in a lot of cases, we are exporting to the same markets. I mean, obviously, different portions of that market, but but ultimately, you know, there's stuff going to China, there's stuff going to uh, the Asia Pacific re region in general. Can that value chain create uh, collaboration actually work in a more uh, I don't know what's the best term holistic manner? Yeah, so Bernie, you make an excellent point. And, and I think that, I think we saw some of that. Uh, and, and, you know, Fawn and I have, have spoken and met, um, we met very quickly as the challenges started to occur. I think that um, in silos, each industry was working as value chains, but thinking forward and, and an excellent idea, 
is, is how do we um, maybe facilitate more sharing across sectors in the agri-food space. Um, there was definitely some of that um, collaboration going on, but thinking to the future and, and how we minimize impact of crisis uh, management as a country, you know, how do we, it's a great question, and I think it's one that has yet to be answered, but has promised, how do we really get it together as a comprehensive agri-food system to weather the storm and work together to maybe even get the leg up in situations that are challenging. So I think it's an excellent, excellent point and an excellent question for discussion. Thanks, Jen. Fawn, did you want to add a comment? And Claire, I seen your hand there. I'll, I'll catch you too. Go to Claire. Oh, sorry. What was I? Oh, sorry. I said go to Claire, but I can, I can, I can talk about it. I think that absolutely collaboration between, um, you know, different sectors of agriculture is, um, is absolutely imperative. It's not only imperative for how we look at building solutions when we have challenges, because certainly our challenges are, are very similar. And, you know, one I've had experience with is, you know, I worked a lot on sustainability within the beef sector and, you know, sharing experience with the crop sector, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, synergies there. And I think that it's also something that we need to um, explain to consumers and to um, governments about how integrated our, our systems are. I mean, DDGs are used in feed production, cattle are grazing on, um, you know, stubble after, you know, when we have um, vegetables that aren't suitable for um, for human consumption, they go into cattle feed, you know, it's so integrated. And I think that any way that we can um, build, make them um, more resilient, I think is, is just going to benefit our, our producers and the whole supply chain. Perfect. Thank you. And Claire? Yes, just very briefly on the question on the topic of trade and resilient uh, agri-food supply chains, I just wanted to point to a report which was issued recently by the FAO and echoed by the WTO. Uh, the title is The State of Agriculture and Commodity Markets, and it looks at um, the policy responses that were um, utilized in, uh, in response to the COVID uh, pandemic and how food value chains nationally and globally responded. And it highlights that trade in agri-food has remained strong, but it demonstrates that international trade in food and agriculture commodities is absolutely central to the future of agriculture itself. Uh, essentially the need for unfettered trade um, and the need to supply, to manage uh, supply chains, not avoid those, those risks uh, related to it. So just wanted to emphasize the importance of trade, which is um, highlighted by the FAO and the WTO um, um, in response to the pandemic in, in particular. Perfect, I appreciate the feedback. All right, uh, for the sake of time, I'll move us along here again a little bit. And uh, Claire and Jen, I'm gonna focus this question on the two of you. Uh, so what things concern you about global agri-food trade as you look five to 10 years down the road? Uh, Jennifer, I'll start with you. So, you know, I spoke earlier on innovation and its criticality to future success. And when there's not global consensus on things like plant breeding innovation and uh, acceptance of crop protection products, the path to commercialization at times is unclear, uh, globally misaligned, and it carries significant risk. And in that type of environment, great ideas and innovations aren't able to get commercialized when they could create value or solve problems that exist because they lack acceptance in one of our major markets and their detection could have dramatic impact. And, and so, you know, commercialization is avoided. So um, we really need to get a handle on this so that the, that, the, that the lack of market access due to misaligned regulatory systems doesn't impede our ability to compete. And, and another thing, you know, I think about is ensuring, you know, as was mentioned earlier and is, is going on continually, is that trade isn't used as a weapon. So we must work towards um, a global trading environment that 
is rule rules based and and this is going to require strong industry and government partnership and and a lot of work because if we can't get to that place we're going to continually be fighting these challenges that aren't necessarily science based thanks jen um claire thanks um i worry that we take uh, agriculture and food in canada for uh Granted, I worry that we're not um, putting it enough um, as an uh, in front and center as much as as, as we should. Um, it is certainly viewed as a sector that feeds uh, families, but um, it's not known enough how much I think of a, an economic contributor um, it, it is uh, to the sector and to the economy. Uh, Overall, um, farmers and, and food producers, yes, make food, but they also create jobs um, and they drive a lot of the Canadian uh, economy. And I think in both urban and rural communities, and I think that has to be known um, uh, a, a lot more for, for the, the support to be uh, behind the, the, the sector. And then I worry also that we take uh, trade for granted. We say we are a trading nation, uh, but yet the list of non-tariff barriers continues to uh, grow uh, by the week. And I very much worry about the protectionist uh, climate that we are in. We are, even in our own backyards, we are reading and hearing about um, measures being introduced um, that contradict uh, trade rules. So how can we stand up uh, in the world and speak to the, the importance of trade when in at home uh, we are not uh, always uh, uh, necessarily uh, doing uh, what needs to be done. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, so moving on here, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about the recent election in the U.S. Uh, it's interesting, I guess, uh, at the time of recording here, that's all starting to looking like it's settling out. So I guess maybe the question is to you, Claire, um, will U.S. trade policy change under a Biden presidency and uh, will Canadian agri-food trade be impacted? I mean, uh, you, you've all touched on uh, on the impacts that we've had. Uh, what's the what's the potential here now in uh, the U.S., one of our biggest trading markets? Thanks for the question. I was asked the same question uh, yesterday and, and my answer um, will be the same here too. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball course, and it would be highly uh, speculative, speculative to really comment in much greater detail. But I, what I can say is, um, you know, the Biden administration has uh, clearly commented on the need to focus on domestic uh, issues uh, first. Um, so it remains to be seen uh, what really will will uh, happen from a trade uh, perspective, and whether the tone uh, will will change. The tone is one thing; the policy is uh, is another one. The protectionist America First agenda appears to remain politically quite popular across party lines. So, really, if things will change and how and when, um, we have to uh, essentially. Uh, wait and see. But one thing is for sure is that with the importance of the U.S. and North American market for Canadian agriculture and the Canadian economy at large, we must continue to work very closely with our American um, counterparts, as well as continue to pursue a trade diversification uh, strategy and intensify or pursue new opportunities in, uh, in global markets. There are many files which we share with the uh, with the U.S. Kasma, um, uh, but we also have much work to do uh, at the WTO uh, with them as well. Thank you, Claire. And you just led right into a follow-up question for me. And uh, if you don't mind, can we touch on? I know you did in your presentation. Can we touch on the WTO and maybe more specifically the uh, appellate body. And, and again, I'm, I'm asking you to look into that crystal ball, but uh, that's obviously an important one for us. And the modernization of the WTO is obviously quite uh, quite important for Canadian agriculture. So uh, again, I realize it might be crystal balling here a little bit, but if you could just provide a little bit of feedback there, it should be appreciated. 
So there's a lot of, I will say, hot potatoes at the WTO uh, these days, as I briefly mentioned, officials working to literally safeguard the system and, and hold it together. Um, the WTO um, body not being fully functional and losing its last member, I think in the coming weeks, uh, really should be a wake up call that things need to be looked at very, very seriously. Um, I, I don't believe that thing, things will change drad, drastically um, over the, the coming weeks, but certainly this should be, um, this is top of the agenda for officials of all WTO members um, in, in Geneva. So um, finding a, um, a way to either uh, move forward with the interim um, appeal mechanism while in parallel continuing to pursue talks about the the reinstating and making sure that the WTO, the dispute settlement system uh, works. That being said, there's also other important files that continue to um, uh, move at the WTO. The reform discussions on uh, the need to reform the organization that has been in place for 25 years. The need to improve the work of the committees and to get the negotiations actually back on track. Uh, the Agriculture Committee has not really delivered on substantial um, negotiations uh, since Doha. Yes, there's been some, some work in, done in Nairobi and so forth, but we remain very far from the um, ambitions of the Doha agenda. So perhaps COVID uh, will provide the impetus to uh, get people back to the table. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier that there are some um, positive developments around the SPS discussions. Uh, this is interesting and so, certainly something that is on our, our radar. Perhaps it's something that more trading nations can, can look at. Um, and, uh, and I would assume that uh, agriculture exporting and importing nations uh, are watching as well. So we're, we're sensing some, some movement um, it's important now that a date be set for the next um, ministerial meeting at um, which was to take place last July um, and is now set for 2021. So it'll be important for agriculture uh, exporting nations to uh, really work together um, and see what concrete movement can be done, both on SPS, on agriculture um, negotiations, domestic subsidies, of course, is a is a major topic these days, along with uh, transparency and, and the timeliness of uh, notification. So lots, lots being done and lots of um, files that continue happening there that continue to have an, a real impact for the farmers, the ranchers, um, producers and food manufacturers uh, here in Canada. Very good. Thank you, Claire. Uh, that wasn't much crystal ball. That's pretty to the point, And I, I appreciate your perspective on that. Uh, so again, I, I, I'm trying to keep us on time here and we are starting to get close. So I'll, uh, I'll move us along here. I have another question then for Jennifer and Fawn. Uh, so quickly, are Canadian or sorry, are Canada's farmers uh, supply chains and infrastructure position for success when it comes to meeting our export goals? Uh, it's been referred to here a couple of times uh, by 2025, reaching 75 billion or an increase of 20 billion by 2025. And if not, what needs to happen to get us there? Uh, Jennifer, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Bernie. So there, there's work to be done here. So going forward, it's not going to be enough to just get by. Um, there needs to be critical attention placed to reducing bottlenecks and minimizing delays in our supply chains and in the infrastructure space. I think you know, we can focus on efficiency and where we can increase our ability to get product to export destinations um, at every step of the way. I mean, that's one, one way to, to, to deal with the upcoming challenge, you know, using real, rail capacity as an example. We can look at efficiencies at primary elevator locations. We can ensure that there is a guaranteed standard of service by carriers that can be relied upon um, but we need adequate track infrastructure and commitment to capacity. Um, when you look at the ports and our infrastructure there, we really need to ensure going forward that the agri-food supply chain has access to the capacity that we need. And that's going to include investment in infrastructure and prioritization of agri-food. 
you know, you can come as a, become as efficient as you want inland, but if you can't get the product out to export, you know, you're, you're lost. So, so there has to be a strong focus um, on infrastructure and, and I call out specifically the ports. And so um, when you look at the grain and oil seed industry, one of our advocacy priorities is, is to really ensure that infrastructure development is aligned with our production and growth goals, as you mentioned, because as I say, there's still work to do there. Very good, thank you. Fawn? Yeah, I would say that the large blocks are there, um, but that we need to continue driving forward and we certainly can't fall behind. Um, you know, you asked your question about the US and what might that look like uh, in the future. And, you know, I, I think that I would look back at what they did over the last number of years and say that they were very bold in how um, they led negotiations and there was advancements made, right? And, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see whether those advancements are really resilient. Um, but I think that we need to make sure uh, that we're not that we're not falling behind. I, uh, you know, an example of that would be, um, you know, they were able to make advancements in um, China, they have made advancements on technical access in a number of Asian markets, and, and we were not there. And so uh, I think that we need to really be strategic uh, uh, going forward, uh, particularly where our competitors are, are um, able to make advancements. I think uh, the second thing is, you know, looking around the corner and, and being able to see what's coming down the pipeline. And, uh, you know, I think I've talked about the technical side of things, um, but one that I, I certainly agree with Jennifer, as she was talking about previously, uh, is environment. And uh, that this is going to be a conversation um, that is important to uh, customers in Canada, but also uh, customers globally. And I think that they're is going to be more um, trade and environment uh, paired together and needing to be able to um, address that. You know, I have uh, full belief that uh, Canada is very strong on our environmental position, but how do we make sure that within uh, trade agreements that outcomes are what are, are recognized, not you must do this. Um, so I think that uh, we need just to be looking around the corner and, and thinking about, about that. And, Particularly, you know, with what's happening in the U.S., if if um, uh, President Biden um, um, comes uh, comes to fruition, I suppose, um, you know, they've uh, they've made the commitment that um, climate is absolutely uh, high up on their uh, priority list. And as our biggest trading partner, I think we better um, be thinking about uh, what that might mean for, for Canada. You know, I think it's very natural to think, well, Europe is going to um, continue to drive that conversation, but there's certainly stakeholders, uh, other key stakeholders who are also driving that conversation. So fully believe that Canada is prepared uh, in terms of what we have for outcomes right now, but how do we communicate it? How do we prove it? Uh, these sorts of things I think are going to be key going forward. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so last question, it's similar to question one in the sense that we were looking for how can Canada better position itself for export success in the future. Uh, so I'm going to actually refer to all three of you. I'll start with Claire. Uh, the slight difference here is how can farmers best position themselves to take advantage of these trade opportunities. And I mean, I, I've written lots down here already. I think I've seen some of it, but I'll, I'll maybe just let you guys uh, sum that up. So Claire, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. I think briefly uh, continue to speak um, about the need to hold the line against protectionism and speak to the need how trade is part of your future. Um, it, essentially, those two, those two points. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer? So I think on this front, it's being aware of market demands and, and participating in them. So when when farmers participate in programs that exporters or crushers have that give access into non-traditional markets, it's really going to position them to take advantage of trade opportunities. Um, example being uh, being part of the sustainable canola program and gaining access to the EU market. It, it's beneficial when we see disruptions due to political tensions with other countries. Another great example is glyphosate free on oats and malt barley programs um, 
So it's just being aware of the market demands and, and taking advantage of, of those opportunities in partnership with, with industry. Thanks, Jen. And Fawn? <clears throat> Yeah, I completely agree is, you know, thinking about how you can build resiliency, um, both, you know, as I mentioned previously, through business risk management, I think is going to be uh, really key through diversification uh, is going to be uh, really key. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it's also important for us to be communicating the importance of this to our members of parliament and to our uh, MLAs. Um, and, and saying, you know, my farm is dependent on, on trade and what are you doing to help me uh, drive that forward and get more jobs for Canadians? So, uh, you know, I think that there's, there's lots of opportunity and, and we all have a role to play to be able to capture it. Very good, thank you. All right, and now I realize we're really getting tight on time here. So I've, I've actually jotted down quite a few points. I'll try and get through and, and summarize what I heard here today. Uh, so, I mean, ultimately, agriculture is extremely dependent on trade. Uh, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. I clearly heard that from all three of you today. Uh, open and reliable trade is, is critical. Uh, successful trading relationships are obviously dependent on open and continued dialogue with our trading partners. Uh, and, and it sounds like we need to improve that even more so. Uh, boots on the ground, I think, is a term I heard uh, through the presentation here today. Uh, we have many successful free trade agreements. Um, that doesn't happen by chance. And I, I think it was Claire had mentioned that we shouldn't be taking this for granted. I couldn't agree more. Uh, that was actually a note that I put down here not to take this type of stuff for granted. Um, Claire, I, I kind of bug you a little bit about the WTO and the modernization aspect of it. Uh, we need that to help provide that policy tool to uh, allow for rules-based trade, which at, at one point through the presentation, you all touched on rules-based trade. Uh, modernization of the WTO, I think, will be critical for that to happen. Um, continuing to expand and diversify markets, we all touched on that, or I heard you all touch on that as well. Um, you know, whether we're implementing new free trade agreements or fostering existing free trade agreements, and then ultimately, all the while, being careful not to become too reliant on individual markets, I think, is, uh, is a critical point here as well. And so, so as I think about all this, I had... Uh, uh, and leading into this, I even just, I, I thought, well, I'm going to try and pro provide some points from the, from a farmer type perspective. And uh, so I'll just start off with saying that in the sense like agriculture is an intricate balance of so many factors. And, and a lot of those factors are simply out of our control as agricultural producers. Um, you know, a couple examples, weather, uh, our productive ability, uh, consumer and customer perspectives. Uh, I heard that mentioned a few times here today. Uh, competing nations, that's big. Uh, and I realize these are very broad strokes of the brush, but uh, the ability to trade goods internationally uh, is, an important, uh, is an important part, and, and this all touches on that. Uh, many of these factors happen behind the scenes, and, and so to Claire, let's not take this for granted. Uh, you know, as a, as a farmer, I guess an example of this is I, I grow the commodity, <clears throat> I, I market the commodity, I move the commodity to town. And at that point, I can kind of sort of forget about it. But again, this is being overly simplistic. Let's not take it for granted. Uh, the reason that it is relatively easy for me is because international trade is critical. Uh, that does not happen by accident. And I thank the three of you here today, as well as all involved in the industry to be sure that trade continues in a somewhat unhindered manner. Uh, and I know, and I heard it today numerous times, there's difficulties, but there's lots of opportunity. And so I think with that, I'm probably a couple minutes over time, uh, but I haven't got the I haven't got the hook yet. So so with that, I'll I'll maybe sum up and and we'll call it a session. Thank you to to all three of you. Thank you very much. Thanks.